Hi, we're back. We're going to continue reading Bomb. And this time we're starting on the section call it, called The Gadget. On the evening of April 15, 1943, about 40 physicists gathered in what used to be the library reading room of Los Alamos Ranch School. A small blackboard on wheels stood at one end of the room. In front of the blackboard were several rows of, rows of folding chairs. Everyone took seats except Robert, Robert Oppenheimer and his assistant, Robert Serber. Buildings were still under construction, remembered Cerber. There was a hammering off in the background, carpenters and electricians working out of sight, but all over the place. Oppenheimer introduced Cerber and sat down. Cerber looked down at his notes and began reading quietly with a slight stutter. But he opened with a bang. The object of the project is to produce a practical military weapon in the form of a bomb in which energy is released by a fast neutron chain reaction. There was a second of stunned silence. Until that moment, many men in the room had not known exactly why they'd been dragged to this remote mountaintop. Scribbling graphs and formulas on the blackboard as he spoke, Serber began to explain the physics of an atom atomic bomb. He wasn't much of a speaker, the physicist Isidore Rabbi recalled, but for ammunition, he had everything Oppenheimer's theoretical group had uncovered during the last year. He knew it all cold, and that was all he cared about. Cerber had the room's attention, until a sharp crack interrupted the talk. Startled, everyone looked up. They saw a jagged hole in the thin ceiling above, and dangling through the hole, the wiggling leg of electrician. The scientists heard the man call for help. They heard men running on the floor above. Then they saw the leg slowly slide up through the hole and disappear. Cerber returned to his lecture. Almost every sentence included the word bomb, which began to worry Oppenheimer. He leaned to the physicist beside him, John Manley, and whispered something. Manley walked up to Cerber and told him to stop saying bomb. There were too many workers around. When Cerber resumed his talk, he referred instead to the gadget. The name stuck. Around Los Alamos after that, explained Cerber, we called the bomb we were building the gadget. To get to work, scientists struggled through the mud to the half-finished tech area, which housed labs and offices and was surrounded by another fence nine feet high with barbed wire strung along the top. Military police guarded the only gate 24 hours a day. To gain entrance, scientists had to show their white badges. Only, sci only the scientists were issued these special photo IDs. Oppenheimer arrived at the gate of the tech area each morning at 7.30, flashed his white badge, and walked to his office. This was a big change from his Berkeley days. A lover of late-night parties, he'd never scheduled classes before 11 a.m. But Oppenheimer knew that it wasn't just his reputation and career on the line at Los Alamos. It was the outcome of the biggest war in human history. And in case the pressure wasn't intense enough, President Roosevelt spelled it out in a personal note. Whatever the enemy may be planning, American science will be equal to the challenge, Roosevelt wrote to Oppenheimer. With this thought in mind, I send this note of confidence and appreciation. Oppenheimer thanked Roosevelt for the kind words, adding, There will be many times in the months ahead when we shall remember them. Then came a memo from General Leslie Groves. Given Oppenheimer's vital importance to the country, wrote Groves, it is requested that A. You refrain from flying an airplane of any description. The time saved is not worth the risk. B. You refrain from driving in an automobile for any appreciable distance above a few miles and from being without suitable protection on a lonely road. C. In driving about town, a guard of some kind should be used, particularly during the hours of darkness. These were sensible precautions, but the truth is that Groves had more than safety on his mind. Many of Groves' intelligence officers still didn't trust the Los Alamos director. They believed he was secretly a communist and perhaps even in touch with Soviet agents. They wanted him under constant surveillance. Army Counterintelligence Corps, DIC agents, hid microphones in Oppenheimer's office. They listened in on his phone calls and read his mail. Even Oppenheimer's personal driver and bodyguard, the one Groves insisted he have, was actually an undercover agent. Oppenheimer sensed he was being watched, but he never guessed how closely. On June 12th, he traveled to Berkeley to recruit more brains for Los Alamos. CIC agents followed him every step of the way.